My name is Brad. I'm from Canada, and um, I'm currently the Dean of Theology and Culture at St. Stephen's University, the smallest university in Canada, <laughs> with an enormous department of about 15 students, and I quite like it in terms of grading. <laughs> Less papers to grade. And, um, and uh, so among other things, I, I have a passion about knowing and how do we know. And I've always, I've always had that. It started for me as wonder. And I think I was on the right track at first. That knowing involved wonder, it involved intuition, it involved exploration. It was uh, sort of a constructivist model of, of going out and exploring the world. I remember uh, once when I was about seven years old, I, I thought I would like to try geology. So I went, to, uh, I went to the garage and I found a hammer and a chisel and I thought I'm going to go get rocks. And then I made my way down to Sturgeon Creek in Winnipeg, Canada. And I, I, I remember trying to chisel rocks and it wasn't moving and I thought I'm just going to lay down now. And it was very cold and I think I might have almost froze to death. So uh, exploration's not always been uh, a thing that's worked for me, but I, that's where I started. And I remember uh, as a child and to this day just constantly reading astronomy articles, biology articles, all of the, all of the, the good uh, scientific stuff in terms of discovery. Uh, but I also grew up in, a, in an evangelical home where knowing was about indoctrination and, and rote memory of scripture and of the things that we must believe in order to be good to be saved and so on. And I bought in uh, fully. Um, by the time I got to high school, I started having doubts. And so then I became fascinated with books like Evidence That Demands a Verdict by Josh McDowell. You know, hardcore empirical rationalist approaches to proving God. And, um, and I imagined that he had done that in the book. At least it looked good on the cover, the gavel. And he was going to give us evidence. And it, so I read the book, and it actually, it, 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 I may have been in a delusion, but it felt like my faith had been sturdied by this uh, really a modernist approach um, that bought into enlightenment thinking about knowing that is, you can't know something unless you can prove it in a court or test it in a lab. So rationalism and empiricism. And when scientism demanded that of us, we gave in to that court. We entered that court and said, okay, that is the criteria, and now we've got to come up with the evidence. And um, I just even don't think that's how life works. So let, let's just back up for a second. Uh, I remember at the end of Jesus and the Victory of God by N.T. Wright, he asks, he's asked this question. Um, Let's say, did Jesus know? Did Jesus know that he was God? That's the, uh, the question. And then Wright's answer is, Jesus didn't know that he was God in the way that I know I'm a man by looking in the mirror with my clothes off. Uh, Jesus knew that he was God in the way I know my wife loves me. Okay, this opens up broader possibilities of knowing. And so what is knowing? And so um, I want to look at, we'll call this, we're, we're going to call this Plato, Plantinga, and Paul toward Christian knowing. And, um, and so I want to start with this idea of, uh, of a broader way of knowing or that there is almost like a hierarchy of knowing. There, and uh, if we could, and so I'm going to use, this is a certain interpretation of Plato. Um, this would be a Simone Weil, W-E-I-L, the great French mystic philosopher. It's her interpretation of him. So I'm not saying this is really how it is. I'm saying I, I like her interpretation in terms of talking about knowing. So her interpretation of, uh, of Plato or Plato's Socrates, I'm pointing over there because Socrates is on the ethics thing, poster. Um, uh, one way of talking about that is is he talked about a divided line. And I'm going to use this wall to talk about that divided line. And here's the line. And he would say, the very lowest possible way of knowing is opinion. 
It is Facebook comments. <laughs> but here's the weird thing in classical Greek, so this is almost 400 years before the New Testament's written. That word is pistis, which we translate faith. But that's not what they're talking about at this point. At that stage in Greek, that word pistis meant, it meant, it meant opinion. Facebook comment. Isn't it amazing how much people know once they get on a comment board? And he recognizes that it's just vacuous. And so he says, you know, if we move up the hierarchy, um, there's a better way of knowing than just opinion. And, and we would call it, now we would call it empirical proof. That is, things you could test in a lab where you can look at it, you can observe it directly, you can touch it, you can measure it. And he, so he says that kind of empirical knowledge that we can test in a, in a lab under a microscope or take it, cut it open with a scalpel, um, that's, that's better than opinion, isn't it? It's a kind of proof. Uh, but sometimes you're able to move up from there in, in this model and say sometimes you can do it without any objects or five senses at all. You could do it all in your head. And we call it reason. So rationalism, the ability to, have, to work with concepts in your mind without even needing to cut open a frog on a, on a dissecting table or, or to be able to measure something. You could do it all in your head, but you could, you, so they, we would develop reason and the whole laws of, of, of uh, you know, that become rationalism for us eventually. And so we got opinion and then we got, we got um, the lab and then we got r rationalism. And then, and then in this model, he says, but you get to this line and there are, things, there are things to know that you can't know below that line. Things that opinion and empiricism and, and rationalism can't get you to. Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps we're actually, we stop there. Later on when the enlightenment comes along, they'll say not only can we not know things above that line, they don't even exist. So anything you can't test in a court or prove in a lab or test in a lab or prove in a court doesn't exist but plato's socrates says actually there are things beyond that and you can know them you just have to know them in higher ways and he'll um and and then how do you know them how do you how do you know about god how do you know about truth how do you know about beauty What's beauty? How do you prove beauty? Um, what, about, what about things like grief and death? What do you, we need to know some things about this, but, but our minds and our labs are, are, are limited. And so, um, so as we move into this higher realm above the divided line, you're going to need another organ with which to know. And in Greek, it's called the nous, N-O-U-S. It's sort of like heart slash mind, but it's the organ of the soul that perceives things that you can't test directly. It, 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 you perceive things that, by, that, that can only be revealed to you. You perceive things that, that, uh, that, that reason can't know. And actually, that's really normal. That's practical everyday life. So, and does that count as knowing, though? And so we have, we have uh, in scientism, we say, no, you can't, you can't know it. You can't know these things. And, and Socrates, or Plato's Socrates, says, yes, you can, if, if you use the noose. And he uses analogies for this, like the sun. If, if God or the good is like the sun and it's shining on us, you're going to perceive it with the eyes of your heart. So that becomes an analogy for the noose. It's the eyes of your heart with which you see the divine rays of sunshine that, that pour beauty and truth and justice into this world. And you behold it, but, but you can't make it. You have to kind of welcome it and wait for it and be open to it. And so this is, so there's a certain trend, uh, a certain interpretation of Plato that, that says he's the father of all mysticism because you have to you have to wait and so um, 
he gives this analogy of the cave that I think that gets mistaken badly because it's about knowing. So the idea, I'll tell you the story of the cave, the interpretation, the wrong interpretation, I think, and then what I believe is, is a better way to see it. So in the analogy of the cave, he starts with a prisoner and there's a prisoner down deep in this cave and he is chained to the ground and all he can do is look forward. He can't look behind him. And all he sees on the walls of the cave are these shadows. And the shadows are being cast by a campfire behind him and the things that are passing in front of the, ca the campfire. And whatever it is that's passing in front of the campfire, it's like images and so on, are, they're projected by the fire onto the cave wall. And this guy just is sitting there and he thinks that's reality. And sort of like the, de de the delusions of his own mind, the opinions he has, the things, the things that, the propaganda of the world. And, um, and at some point, somehow, and this is grace, his chains are broken. And someone or something comes and begins to drag him out of the cave. And at first he sees like, oh, there's a campfire. I didn't know there was a campfire in the cave. Maybe even some people get stuck there. They're still in the cave of delusion, but at least there's a campfire. Maybe it's going to be pop psychology is my campfire. There, I've arrived. But whoever or whatever it is that drags him from the cave takes him to the mouth of the cave and suddenly he realizes there's a world outside, but at first it's so bright. He can't even look. He's got to shield his eyes because he's never seen sunlight before. But as he waits at the mouth of the cave, eventually his eyes start to adjust and, and he can even look out and, and see that there's reflections in a lake that maybe there's a sun in the sky and he can see the reflection and his eyes adjust more and then, and then he looks up and oh, there's a sun and sunshine, and, and he realizes there's a whole other world out here. Um, and, and then he feels compelled to go back in the cave. But when he goes back in the cave, his eyes are already, they're, they're so adjusted to the light that he's stumbling around in the darkness. And what Socrates says is, um, as he's trying to tell people in the cave about the light outside, they become angry with him and they think he's deluded because look, he's drunken. He's stumbling around in the dark. He's clearly a fool. And if they could get out of their chains, they would beat him and kill him. And so, so that's sort of the, but it's love that drove him into the cave. So there's lots of ways to interpret that. I'm going to use it for this analogy that the, that the, the, the uh, shadows on the wall are like those opinions and, and, and sort of what the world has taught us to buy into. Let's say it's even how advertising tells you who you are and what you need to do to belong and, to, and how you need to behave and all that, and, and we just buy into it. No, I'm going to measure up if I just get the right watch, if I can wear what Brad Pitt wears. Or I, like, uh, but you could have religious delusions as well. If you could just do in this and that thing, maybe you'd be good enough. Maybe you'd be a good person. Maybe if you kept all these rules and so on. So there's lots of ways to be chained down. Um, but the idea, if we come back to the divided line, is that, is that whoever or whatever it is brings us to the mouth of the cave, brings us to a place of waiting at this divided line where we open our noose, that organ of the soul, the eyes of our heart, and we begin to behold a bigger world that's way bigger than, let's say, uh, modernism, or scientism, or evangelicalism, or like just a much a, a more cosmic gospel. And, and yet, um, so, so how, what is it to know that way? What is, this, what is this noose? And what Simone Weil will say about this is you'll never get it. So Nietzsche has an interpretation and Heidegger has an interpretation. All these philosophers are trying to work with this cave analogy and Weil says they just missed the whole thing. Because the seeing of the noose, beholding, is love. And what behold, you behold the love of God, which is the light of God. And you can't climb your way to heaven. You have to wait there for the sun, the sun to shine on you and to warm you up. And, to, and, and, and uh, Plato will even say, and to, to create the very eyes that will see the sun which is kind of interesting because in terms of evolutionary development, that's actually what happened. Uh, sunlight begins to create human eyes, 
or create animal eyes or whatever. So, but that's another story. So, so, so we, are, we are given the eyes to see and to behold and, and to have a higher way of knowing. Here's the weird thing is that um, in the Enlightenment, they read Plato too, and they just read all of this as rationalism. So we'd say, uh, and, and, they, and so in, in, they began to translate this as the people who come above that higher and they open up their noose and they behold God. They're intellectuals. It's like, <laughs> that's kind of a, a rationalistic way to describe it. I would call them mystics, really, or maybe just seers. All right, so that's, that's one thought, that's one part. So we have this foundation that there's a higher way of knowing than scientific rationalism and em em empirical proofs. There's more to be known than what is revealed in a lab or a court, and I, th and I really do think we know it. We experience it all the time in normal human relationships. How do you, you know, how do I know things happen? Well, and this is where Elvin Plantinga helps us. So Plantinga is an American philosopher, and he talks about knowing a lot. And so um, he noticed this, this same problem, that people began to think, you need to prove God, and, and you can only use empiricism and rationalism, and so we get sucked into that, and he goes, that's not the only ways we know God. There's lots of ways we know many things. I, and so he starts doing what he calls um, warrant, sufficient warrant. And when you have sufficient warrant, you can have confidence that is better than proof, that makes proof unnecessary and even insufficient. So what are some ways that we know besides proving in a lab or, or, or reasoning it in a court? Let's do a little interaction here. How do you know anything? What do you know? Some things you know? Do you know your husband loves you? How do you know? Experience. Experience. And, and so direct experience counts as a, we won't call it knowing yet, we'll call it warrant. We're, we're, build, we're gonna build some warrant. So yes, I go to the lab, yes, I go to reason, but also like experience counts as warrant. Most of what we know or think we know, at least, we, we experience directly. You know your husband loves you because you've experienced that love. And, and I don't know, maybe you could prove it in a court or test it in a lab, but like, don't, just get a room. <laughs> and, um, and, and so experience is, is a way we know. Yeah, what else would count? Intuition. Intuition. Wow, so explain that. Uh, you walk down a dark alley and you feel like it could be dangerous and you see someone walking towards you that looks threatening and you feel, you, you feel, you know, the alarm bells are there. You know, yeah. yeah. So intuition is a, is a form of warrant and sometimes we find out our intuitions were totally wrong but sometimes it's like, whoa, I'm glad I checked that. I was walking down a, a highway one time, I was really angry and, and, and uh, sad and self-hating at the same time because my van had broken down and I had to wear I had to wear these to run like five kilometers down to the next city in the middle of the night and um, as I'm running down I'm trying to run and I'm forming these giant blisters right and I'm like God you must hate me and I'm like, I hate me worse and like <laughs> it was just a really bad deal I think we blew the transmission on our, our van and my wife's back in the van with her kids and they're all crying and I'm like just five more k's to go and it was like the really steep road um rick might know it it's the road that goes down into merit from the coquihalla connector and i'm running down there and it's about midnight now and there's semi trucks coming behind me vroom, vroom, vroom. and 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 it's a little scary and there's but there's a big there's a big concrete divider just to my right and so i'm like between the semi trucks and who can't see me in time anyway and this big concrete divider and I get this intuition that came as a voice. You might want to get off the road for the next truck. And I'm like, like all the way off? All the way off. But then I, that meant I had to crawl over the concrete barrier and now I'm in hip deep wet grass, feeling stupid. Until the next truck came by and would have plowed me down. It was right where I was walking. So I might call that God, but we'll at least call it intuition. 
And sometimes our intuition is warranted. It, this is more common for mothers. I remember when our son Dominic was very little and my wife's intuition would just kick in, right? She's like, and she'd go, Dominic? And he'd go, nothing. <laughs> then he'd come out and he'd use permanent marker on his entire face. Yeah. Green face, yeah. So, um, so that's another way. So, so now we're building these other ways of knowing. Access to secret knowledge, esoteric okay. knowledge. Which would be kind of, so when you talk about using the noose for that, the, uh, the, 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 the adjective would be noetic knowledge. Um, things you couldn't know. This is Jeremiah um, 33, verse 3. Um, if you call on me and I'll answer you. And I will show you things that you couldn't know, except that I showed them to you. So you could talk about esoteric knowledge in the Judeo-Christian thing. You could talk about revelation knowledge. Um, with the, uh, uh, the, yeah. So there's a whole range around that. Any other? Yep. I think um, faith, small f, is a critical part of knowing. Yep. If you ask, how do I know my wife loves me? If yep. I disbelieve that she loves me, I no longer know it. This is different than this opinion kind of faith, isn't it? So how do you practice that kind of faith? Just review that for us, Tony. Uh, I practice it by taking it seriously and beginning to visualize it and make it real. If that were true, then how would I act? So this is very much what Hebrews 11 is describing as faith, where all these heroes of the Jewish faith had a promise, but it's not faith unless they step into the promise. They participate in the thing that, that it's almost like, here's a hypothesis, and now I'm going to step into it by faith. I'm going to put the, and we'll see where it goes from there, and whether the promise holds up, whether the promise of love, for example, holds up. And that's just real life. I think what we're doing is we're describing like how we actually know in real life, and that'd be another way. Yep, you had a your hand up. I was just gonna say testament, like people that I know and trust, they tell me stories, and I'm like, yeah, okay. Yes, yes. So, so that's like it's secondhand experience, but because you know them, testimony really counts. I mean, even in a lab or a court. What did you observe or what did you, what was your eyewitness and you're telling me and there's something about your credibility in my life where I can count it as real knowledge. Yep. Plantinka mentions that one. Yep. I think uh, and related to that is authority. I yep. think most of what I believe is because somebody told me, even in science, I didn't do all these science experiments, but I trust them. Somebody did and they're a position of authority and they, they told me and I trust them, their authority. Yeah. Is that, is that warrant? Yes, it is. I saw another hand. Yeah. Just that just our senses. Yeah, and that kind of goes with empirical knowledge then, right? But, but all five senses. And then with intuition, we've got a sixth sense going. Okay, so we're building a whole list of these. Whoa, more hands are coming up. What do you know? Okay, back to you. How, how can you determine, how do you know that you're not delusional? Who, do, who, are, you, who are you relying or what are you relying on? evidence of your eyes you may believe your wife loves you but every way she acts yeah yeah is counterintuitive to that mm -hmm. um what are you are you are you testing your your own delusions mm -hmm. how do you how do you do that uh, when perhaps you can't rely on the evidence of your eyes perhaps you can't rely on faith right perhaps your faith's a delusion yeah so we're going to end up talking about sufficient warrant okay. and proper function that's, that's a very different Yes. So we're building warrant towards sufficient warrant. Yep. Uh, insight, acts of understanding go beyond the data, go beyond the sense experience. Insight. We planted a church called Fresh Wind. It was people with disabilities, people with addictions, children, and the poor. And that's, I know, I know more about God from that than 12 years of theological studies, probably. Like, honestly about what matters and what doesn't matter. So they became, they became part of my discernment about what, what is reality and what I can know and not know. All right, we want to move a little forward now. So what, what, um, uh, what Pontinga says is, is if, you can, if you can develop 
sufficient warrant, you grow in confidence. And that's different than the kind of certainty we, we lust for through, um, through modernism. So modernism has this great lust for certainty. And my, the church I grew up in was like that. It was a modernist church that wanted evidence that demands a verdict and and yet there's this other thing where what if i don't need that what if not only do i not need it it's not even sufficient to get me there what if instead of certainty i developed a confidence that grows out of accumulated warrant sufficient warrant well and this is where your question comes in what if it's diluted so you also you don't need just enough warrant you have to have proper function and that is um, I, I, I hope I don't think, or I, I hope I don't think that I know the sky is red just because I'm wearing red sunglasses. I hope I don't think that all the skies are red because maybe this, the, the sunrise on Mars is red. So you could be in an environment that's broken or have some part of you that's broken that distorts all of this. So you still have to, we need to be realists and be self-critical and testing testing what we think we know but here would be a great example from the united states uh, back in the day when um, the difference between this kind of certainty and confidence showed up in the oj simpson trials so oj simpson was tried for a murder first of all in criminal court where you have to be able to prove it beyond any reasonable doubt even even though the jury knew he did it, they had to say not guilty because they couldn't prove it. So that kind of certitude based in, in um, empirical law um, meant he went free. But then, he got, then it went to civil court where you don't need that. You just need sufficient warrant to come to a place of such confidence you can say, we know he did it. And he was declared guilty there. Which is more true to life? It seems to me that what's more true to life is that we, we grow in all of these ways that we know until we can come to a place of real confidence that you could test. So that's a little bit about Plantinga. And, um, and so then he applies that later to the Christian faith, for example. And he says, do we have sufficient warrant? And so I still have, I still have let's say... Dilu uh, disillusioned ex-evangelicals who will write me and they're still operating in that old modernist mindset and says, I, I just let go of God because I can't prove it and neither can you. I'm like, I don't need to. <laughs> and I still know. And it's real knowledge, but it's a confidence based in sufficient warrant. And so um, let's move from there. So, so we've got First of all, this idea in, in a certain version of Plato that says that you can know things with your noose, with the eyes of your heart, and with, especially with love that enable you to perceive a bigger, a more cosmic knowing. Second, that that works in real life through these practical warranting factors that grow into, into confidence that you can call knowing. Um, where I see some of this in, in the Apostle Paul is interesting. So I'm looking at 1 Corinthians. Chapter 2. And he says some strange things. And it's just a real classical example of, of Paul's kind of mysticism, I think. Uh, starting 2 verse 6. We speak wisdom among those who are mature. That's a really interesting Greek term, the teloi. Those who have come to their telos, their fulfillment. They've, um, in, I think it's probably Aristotle who said that, that the telos, telos is, a, is a fullness of maturity. It's like the telos of an acorn is an oak tree. Paul is actually calling a certain kind of people this, the teloi, those who've come to maturity. We speak wisdom among the mature, yet not the wisdom of this age. He's talking to Corinthians. He's just been in Athens and had not a great experience. The philosophers, 
the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age, the ones who crucified Christ, who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom, which is God ordained before the ages for our glory. So this, that's a weird thing, mystery. Um, I know as a young evangelical, I was not okay with mystery. I don't know where I picked that. Well, I guess it was my modernism. I didn't like that there was things above the divided line. I didn't like that there was something outside the cave I couldn't know that, and prove and satisfy my lust for certainty. Um, I, I, I didn't like this idea of mystery. But isn't when we're talking about the noose, aren't we also talking about um, the right brain a little bit? Intuition that recognizes mystery. The hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Okay, so now it's a mystery that's been made known. So he, he then quotes a prophet. He says, uh, as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor entered into the heart of man, the things which God has prepared for those who love him. So that's interesting, because he's actually now saying, here are the limits. The things that God has prepared for us, you, you just can't know them with your eyes and ears. You can't know them with your five senses. Uh, they haven't even entered your heart by intuition. There was something bigger. But then he doesn't leave it there. This was a problem in Sunday school. We had <clears throat> a Sunday school teacher. She had all the kids memorize that. I have not, eyes have not seen, nor ears heard, nor has entered into the heart of man all the things God prepared for them who love him. And then, amen, okay, go, you can go to your parents now. I'm like, no, no, you, you can't do that. You've got to read the next verse. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit, for the spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. And for what man uh, knows the things of a man except the spirit of <clears throat> Spirit of a man which is in him. Even so, no one knows the things of God except for the Spirit of God. Oh, too bad. Oh, but wait. Now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who's from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given by God. So that's not even very, that's not so esoteric. It's just like freely given. It's not a, a, a mystery a mystery of religion that has inside information for just a few people. It's like the, the Spirit of God has just been poured out on all flesh to make known um, the things of God, which seems to be to do with the, co the cosmic redemption that's come through Christ. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, spirits from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given. Verse 13, these things we also speak, not in words, which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches. So then the Holy Spirit becomes a warranting factor for Paul. Things that the Spirit reveals, comparing spiritual things with spiritual, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. And by natural man, I think he's talking about those who function just at, below the, the, the divided line. Um, and have rejected this idea of cosmic redemption through Christ. For they are foolishness to him, nor can they know them, because they're spiritually discerned by faith. And, and not just like um, pure mysticism, but this idea of here's a promise, I'm going to step into it and see what happens. Ah, so there's another warranting factor, practice. I tried it. How do you know you can walk across a lake that's got only four inches of ice? I know that because I did it. I also swam home later. <laughs> but he who judges spiritual uh, judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? That's supposed to be a rhetorical question, and the answer is no one. But... We have the mind of Christ. Oh, so somehow, somehow then, um, I think Christianity, at least at, 
in, in the first century for Paul was, was really into this, knowing the things that you can't know other than that they've been revealed by the Spirit to our spirits. They've been revealed to the apostles in terms of gospel, and they're revealed to us directly to our hearts in some way or through testimony. Through, uh, and, and so that's, that brings Paul to, to say, actually, you do know. You do know. You, have, you, know, you know the things that have been revealed, and there's sufficient warrant to be confident in them. And in fact, you now have the mind of Christ and the indwelling spirit to confirm them from the inside so that you're knowing in your knower. I want to get some reflections back about that. I mean, that's like a real, that's a breeze through of of toward Christian knowing means we're going to have to think bigger than some of the apologetics courses I took in Bible college. That was like super, a super narrow, super evangelist, uh, evangelical kind of modernist, I mean, like kind of pseudo knowing that actually has not proven sufficient. And, it, and I don't know that there's a future for it. And good. What if, what if, what if our faith is going to require faith? <laughs> um, what if our practice is going to require practice? What if our testimony is going to require testimonies? And um, so when, we're, when we were working with the, mo- the, the poor and the marginalized and the br- severely broken and the addicted, we didn't, we didn't introduce them to a set of facts we wanted them to sign off on. We introduced them to a living person um, through ministries, let's say, he- inner healing approaches or um, reco- addictions recovery approaches that involved completely surrendering our lives into the care of a loving God and praying as if there was a God when you didn't know until you found out by experience and transformation that there is a loving, caring, forgiving, personal, responsive, divine agent at work. And they're like, oh, oh, you mean this is real? Mm Mm-hmm. How do you know? Look at your life. He's changing something, right? So that's where, for me, it came back to pastoral knowing then, leading people into, uh, we, sorry to use cliches, leading people into the presence of God, except like, no, really. And see, uh, seeing lives made whole again, coming into what the promise is, fullness of life. Some people would call it, you know, eternal life or life more abundant. Fullness of life. Um, how do you know? I've seen fullness of life. So, any quick questions or comments, responses at this point? Yes, sir. Why does modernism have such a hold on the evangelical world? Modernism? Because we invented it. It offers something. It, it, it offers... It, I think it's a shadow offer, but it, and, and I don't have entirely bad things to say about the Reformation, but there, there's a way of tracing modernism back into, in, in, into that era, late scholasticism, early Reformation. And it, we, we don't embrace something unless it offers something it has for us, and then we kind of experience it. So there is a, there's a kind of peace coming from pseudo-certainty. Oh, the, the world is not chaos, and there's no mystery after all. So, so who like Occam or maybe Luther or maybe like we're, we're, they're looking for a, a way to find absolute authority. Oh, here's one, the Bible. I don't have to listen to the Pope now. I got a Bible. So I, I, I need to just fill that out for a moment. So when I, w- what we did in, in evangelicalism, in Protestantism, we would create then doctrinal statements that says the Bible is our final authority for faith and practice. In other words, it's the way we know. And the only way we know, sola scriptura, scripture alone. Um, I think if we follow this model, we can broaden it out. And this comes back to Tony's question in the first place. Glad I didn't forget. (laughs) Um, As a Christian, the the tradition I'm in, 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 
asks for more than that. It says, actually, the Bible's not our final authority. Christ is. How, but how do you know that you're, that you're in practice that Christ is your final authority? And so I, this is partly from discussions around Plantinga. It's, if we would have three interdependent witnesses, the scriptures and the people of God, the church, tradition, whatever, and the indwelling Holy Spirit. And this is what the scriptures themselves say. So the, scripture, the scriptures uh, testify that the church is the pillar and foundation of the truth, which seems like the most radical, crazy, um, falsifiable statement you could come up with. The church? Well, yeah, the people of God produced this Bible. And I pay attention to, to their witness. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, the church pre-exists the New Testament by 30 years or 60 years. We can. Rick? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but also, yeah, and you know, when we knew nuance it, Rick, Rick's right. But, uh, but I am saying it's not scripture alone. We've got scripture and this body, but also that the scriptures have Christ himself saying, I'm giving you the Holy Spirit to lead you into all truth, not I'm giving you the Bible. And yet, and so I look at those as interdependent witnesses. And, and, and if, when I have all three kind of in agreement, I have more confidence. If I can only pick a Bible verse or a warm fuzzy feeling or a yes man, I shouldn't have any confidence at all that I know much. And so I'm feeling like that's our best path to, um, to saying we, we, we know that Christ is our final authority when the interdependent witnesses of Scripture, the body, and the, and the spirit line up. Then I'm like, okay, maybe, maybe I can say I know. Does that make sense? It does. I assume, therefore, that there's a problem about the Bible being the sort of the measure of knowing because we need to know to be able to read the Bible in the first place. So there's, there's a much broader question about knowing to even access the Bible. Yeah, and, and so um, uh, we've got scripture texts saying you just won't understand it without the Spirit. But also, I, I really pay attention to the early church fathers and mothers, to how those who were closest to that era would approach it. And, and so, for example, they, they just, they would be alarmed by our literalism now. It's like, do you not know how to read this book? It's like, well, actually, we can go ask them now, because the fathers are becoming more, um, more accessible. English online with search engines, you know, <laughs> so I think I want to close with a poem about the Bible. So I think what, what happens is sometimes um, we put the Bible, for example, on a dissecting table and, and we just gut it with our modernistic hermeneutics, interpretive systems, and we forget that it's a story. A, like an incredible saga of redemption, but even like from, from creation to new creation. And, um, and it really helps us to, to remember how it's been given to us. Stories work. I've, cha I've made radical changes of mind in my life by watching a movie. And in 90 minutes, I see something completely different. Or, or uh, you know, a, a great novel like Name of the Rose. Okay, so this, this is a poem by Brian Zahn called How to Read the Bible Right. And it's connected in terms of knowing because I, I think we step into the scriptures prayerfully um, and, and with wonder when we, realize, when we realize it's a story. Here we go. How to Read the Bible Right or Reading the Bible Right. It's a story. We're telling news here, keeping alive an ancient epic, the grand narrative of paradise lost and paradise regained, the greatest once upon a time tale ever told, the beautiful story which moves relentlessly toward they lived happily ever after. Never, never, never forget that before it's anything else, it's a story. So let the story live and breathe and thrall and enchant. Don't rip out its guts and leave it lifeless on the dissecting table. 
Don't make it something it's really not, a catalog of wished for promises, an encyclopedia of God facts, a law journal of divine edicts, or a how-to manual for do-it-yourselfers. Find the promises, learn the facts, heed the laws, live the lessons, but don't forget the story. Learn to read the Bible for what it is, God's great big wild and wonderful surprise ending love story. Let there be wonder, let there be mystery, let there be tragedy, let there be heartbreak, let there be surprise, let there be suspense. Let it be earthy and human, let it be celestial and divine. Let it be what it is and don't try to make it perfect where it's not. This fantastic story of creation, alienation, devastation, incarnation, salvation, restoration, with its cast of thousands, more Tolstoy novel than thousand page sermon. It's a story because we're not saved by ideas, but by events. Here's a plot line for you. Death, burial, and resurrection. Yes, it's a story, not a plan, not an ology or ism, but a story. And it's an amalgamated patchwork story told in mixed medium. Narration, history, genealogy, prophecy, poetry, parable, psalm, song, sermon, dream and vision, memoir and letter. So understand the medium and don't try so hard to miss the point. Try to learn what matters and what doesn't. It's not where and when Job lived, but what Job learned in his painful odyssey and poetic theodicy. It's not how many cubits of water you need to put Everest under a flood, but why the world was so dirty that it needed such a big bath. <laughs> trying to find Noah's Ark instead of trying to rid the world of violence really is an exercise in missing the point. Speaking of missing the point, it's not did a snake talk, but what the damn thing said. <laughs> Because even though I've never met a talking snake, I've sure had serpentine thoughts crawl through my head. Literalism is a kind of escapism by which you move out of the crosshairs of the probing question. But parable and metaphor have a way of knocking us to the floor. Prose flattened literalism makes the story small, time confined and irrelevant, but poetry and allegory travel through time and space to get in our face. Inert facts are easy enough to set on the shelf, but the story well told will haunt you. Ah, the story well told, that's what's needed. It's time for the story to bust out of the cage and take the stage and demand a hearing once again. It's a story, I tell you, and if you allow the story to seep into your life so the story begins to weave into your story, that's when at last, my friend, you're reading the Bible right. I feel like if, if we want to know the things we want, to, we, we really want to get to, to what we know, we, we, we need to like trust the story again. Um, when I wanted to share my faith at one point, we would just hand out four spiritual law tracts. But there was a time before that when we would give people the Gospel of John and we'd just say, read this book and ask God if, if you're there, speak to me through this book. Um, and that would lead them to a kind of knowing that signing off on four laws never could. I think we'll stop there. Thanks.